Uh, there's nothing better than, than being at the top and, and looking down. After starting the year world number one, Day has had a difficult time on and off the course, but he's hoping a win here at the Australian Open will kickstart his resurgence, just like Jordan Spieth did a few years ago. And he had his fair share of support today at the Pro-Am from comedian Andy Lee. It's pretty awesome to watch and he's doing everything I tell him. Uh, so, that's, <laughs> so that's the important thing. To five-year-old Isaac Richies, who got to walk the course with his idol. Who's going to win this week? Um, Jason Day. Nearly 80,000 fans will cram into ANZ Stadium. Tim Hipsley is there for us and Tim, I can't imagine there will be too many Honduran supporters there. Absolutely not, Sandra, although I did spot a few Honduras fans just a short time ago. The excitement and anticipation is already at fever pitch as the Socceroos look to qualify for their fourth consecutive World Cup. Yes, there is no denying the magnitude of this game tonight. And the big question everyone is asking is, will Tim Cahill start tonight? I'll speak to a man inside the Socceroos camp and get the answer to you in sport. Sandra. Tim Hipsley, thank you. Looking forward to it. Now, you might recall we told you last week about two mysterious young mates, footy fans who caused quite a buzz at the SCG during the Swans' last game of the regular season. Their names are Mark and Jared, and until now, no one knew who they were. Well, Tim Hipsley has tracked them down, and as you're about to see, what they share is far more precious than a premiership. These two have an unbreakable bond that's built on the love of the game. Even though I can't see it because it still gives me the energy when I hear the crowd warring. 13 year old Mark has been blind for the past four years, diagnosed with two types of cancer in his brain and spine. He almost didn't make it. You know, things are quite difficult for Mark, but he's always been passionate about sport. Anything with a football, Mark is there. And he was at the SCG cheering on the Swans against Carlton with his best mate Jared. And what he did next has melted the hearts of many. He was actually listening to like some other commentary on my phone. Then in the second quarter that didn't work and I just decided to just start commentating so he could hear what was going on. And Mark, how did he go? Amazing. <laughs> best commentary I've ever heard. Isaac Heaney, one on one. Who will get it? And it's 3 2 for Gary Rowan. He goes over the fence. I look very proud. Tim, very proud. Like, a, he's, a, he's a good boy. Um, but that's just Jared as a character. Like, you know, he's been very sensitive around Mark and always done the right thing. It's ground ball, but he's got it. It's a goal! But he's kicked him! Yeah! And today they got to meet the man himself. His buddy. Hello. <laughs> All the Swans players keen to hear their story. How did you go commentating the game uh, last week? Good. Pretty good. The two boys won't need many words to describe the feeling they're going to get this Saturday at the SCG because they've been invited by the Swans to run out with the team in their do or die final against Essendon. And we would love it if you guys could join us on the weekend and run out with us through the banner. Cool. What do you reckon? Like so yeah. Good. Yeah? Oh, I never thought I would, but yeah. It's going to be a lifetime experience. It's really nice that people recognise these things and that their friendship has touched other people as well. I think that's really beautiful that, that they can make other people feel good. And best of all, they do it without even knowing it. They are quite a team, these two. Tim Hipsley, 10 Eyewitness News. Way to go, what a lovely story. It may only be a fleeting visit, but it was enough time for the fans to catch a glimpse of their stars and for the team to immerse themselves in Aussie culture. I don't know exactly where I go now, but I think I blow in a didgeridoo for the first time in my life. <laughs> they were the headline act for 73,000 fans last night. down to business against Sydney FC and it took just seven minutes for their class to show. Right foot strike, Liverpool take the lead. And after a hectic end to their season, they let their hair down until the early hours of this morning. It was good and um, we really enjoyed it and had a little night out in Sydney, so um, we are a little bit tired. And they had fun partying? Yeah, a little bit. So holiday started after the game, so that's how we feel now. Even if you don't follow horse racing, you still want to keep an eye on Randwick tomorrow. Barring a tragedy, magic will in fact happen when the mighty mare Wings goes for 17 wins in a row. And on her back will be the jockey Hugh Bowman. And he's let slip a few secrets to our own Tim Hipsley. 
She's captivated the country just like Black Caviar did a few years ago. Here's Sweet 16 for Wings. And the man with the best seat in the house is Hugh Bowman. The jockey puts in the hard yards every week to be in top shape to ride the best racehorse in the world. Slow on the way down, good control on the way down. When I'm on the horses, when I'm at the races, I'm much more focused. You know, I've been lucky enough to train some pretty good athletes, but Hugh is just, he's just exceptional. Bowman has had 14 of the last 16 rides on Winks and many would think the pair have a close bond, but it's a relationship that is kept quite simple. You get to race day, you go say hi to her, what do you, what do you say, what do you do? No, just hop on, go. And she knows, she knows. Yeah, you. Oh, she's the queen, you know, I'm just the passenger. Tomorrow's $4 million Queen Elizabeth Stakes here at Randwick will be the last race of her campaign before a spell and there's a sense of anticipation and expectation to win 17 in a row. It's a lot of adrenaline and emotion that goes with being a part of her and there's a lot of build up and a lot of hype that can't be ignored. How far can she go? Well, that's, a, that's an unanswerable question really. While she's hot to trot, Bowman is having fun with a cheeky comment to fellow jockeys. She just canned it up beside him and I was just, you know, I had so much horse and uh, I just simply said, I'll, I'll see you later, jocker. <laughs> Let's just hope there's at least one more fine salute from Bowman coming back to the mounting yard. <laughs> All good. <laughs> Tim Hipsleet and Eyewitness News. In an effort to find extra speed on the track in 2017, Daniel Ricciardo has done what most drivers try not to do, and that is gain weight. Tim Hipsley caught up with the Aussie to find out why, ahead of this weekend's season-opening Australian Grand Prix. Daniel Ricciardo is leaving nothing in the tank as he chases that elusive world championship. But how else would I ever expect to get to where I want to be? I kind of wanted to, in a way, overtrain, not overtrain, but be, you know, more than prepared. The Aussie was given a licence to bulk up over the off-season by Red Bull Racing bosses. Cars this year are faster and more demanding, meaning the G-Force's driver's experience will be a lot higher. Well, the team's like, alright, you can put on a few kilos, two, three kilos of, of muscle, because I guess you're going to need it. So I was like, sweet. And he's making no secret he means business for the season opener in Melbourne this weekend, after crossing fourth last year. I don't want to finish up here on Sunday being completely gassed and, and saying, oh, I lost a position because I, I faded towards the end. Ricardo's nice guy image has charmed the country and the racing world, but it was a pit stop blunder in Monaco last year. And they're late, they're late, oh, can you believe it? That made those on the F1 circuit take note of his mean side. Hamilton's got in front because of a slow pit stop. People were super surprised, like, after Monaco, you know, when I, when I ended up finishing second and they saw how, you know, filthy I was um, they were like wow like he's, he, he can get angry like he and I was like yeah like it means a lot to me with just one win in the past two years the door is open for more finishes on top of the podium now last year's champion Nico Rosberg has retired for us to try and yeah get in the mix more and, and put some pressure on Mercedes could be a good thing we'll find out if they've closed the gap when practice starts on Friday Tim Hipsleet and Eyewitness News Cliff diver Rhiannon Ifflin was arguably Australian sport's biggest surprise packet of 2016 after going from wild card to world champion. Now she's back in Sydney as she prepares to defend her crown. Tim Hipsley has a story. It's a, a challenging mental game, getting up there and looking down. The impact there is so, it's pretty harsh on the body. This is Rhiannon Ifland, an adrenaline junkie, a thrill seeker who loves to live life on the edge. But when I tell people what I do, they don't believe me. <laughs> the 25-year-old received a shock wildcard call-up to the Red Bull Cliff Diving World Series just a few weeks before competition started last year and blitzed the field. Beautiful wow. diving. Winning five events en route to claiming the world title. It still hasn't really sunk in, you know. Uh, I just, I do it because I love it. That's, that's the only reason that I'm up there and that I'm, I'm going back. Two years ago, Iflin didn't even know the series existed and was entertaining guests diving on cruise ships. Now she's taking one enormous leap of faith from 23 metres high. I stand there and I, I take a, a moment, I guess, you can kind of call it a, 
of meditate a moment of meditation. You hit the water, you go through the water, you pop your head up and you go, oh my goodness, I want to get back up there and do it again. <laughs> but with the thrill comes its dangers, hitting the water at close to 80 kilometres an hour with an impact of up to 5 Gs. We know the risks and we go out to the platform and, and it is in our head. So each time you're there, you're focused, concentrating on what you have to do and, and just hoping for the best. While jumping off most cliffs around the country is illegal, Ifland hopes her shot to fame might put the sport on the map here in Australia. Fingers crossed that soon we'll have some, some locations and, and some training facilities which will open the doors up for more people and, and maybe Olympics in the next few years is, is one to hope for. Tim Hipsley, 10 Eyewitness News. But as Tim Hipsley explains, it was a wild ride at the start. It looked like it was going to be smooth sailing on the harbour. Clear start, clear start. But it nearly turned into a disaster with Scallywag and Bo Jest narrowly avoiding collision. Oh, oh. While it looked like spectator boats were getting in the way. What's the limit, brother? The frustration was aimed towards a maritime vessel. You'd expect a boat with maritime written on the side of it would actually get out of the way and not stand there and refuse to move. So very, very lucky. Just seven of the big boats were in action today, warming up for the main event on Boxing Day. We didn't break anything for once in the race, uh, so it was a cheaper day out than we're used to having. Perpetual Loyal has unfinished business, the crew forced to retire from their last two Sydney to Hobarts. With last year's winner Comanche deciding not to return, skipper Anthony Bell has lured nine of their crew to come on board Perpetual Loyal. Uh, but when we heard that they weren't coming, the, um, the first thing we thought about was in hiring as many of their crew as we could get. Chaz Mostert has a mountain of memories at Bathurst and he's back to the unforgiving track that turned 2015 into a nightmare. I'm not planning on doing another year like last year. That was uh, pretty crazy to, to come out of a broken leg here and end our season off last year. It was a qualifying session that went horribly wrong. Oh, big, big moment, a massive moment for one of the Pepsi Max cars. He was airlifted to hospital and left with a broken leg and arm. To get around this track in one piece is pretty tricky. Those didn't work out for me last year, but looking forward to try and work it out this year. It's right here coming down the mountain that Mostert clipped the barrier and lost control. And to ease the nerves heading into the weekend, he does admit he has relived that horrifying moment a few times since. You know, it wasn't much in it, clip a wall here and ricochet down the thing. But, um, you know, just going back to the crash, it was all over pretty quick. His imprint has been left on the barrier, but he's also driven the track in a lower class race this year. There's a lot of weight taken off my shoulders coming back now this year. And He spent two years sitting in the stands dreaming of playing for the Swans. Now Alir Alir has turned into a Sudanese sensation. Alir takes off, gives the don't argue on Rioli. Born in Kenya and brought up in a refugee camp, he arrived in Australia with his family as an eight-year-old and only began playing at 16 in Brisbane before heading to Perth. That's where he had to choose between family and football. A lot of nieces and that, that I had to sort of look after and help, help mum out and things like that and, you know, it, it, it was hard. And it nearly forced him to throw in the towel. The family, brothers and that said, you know, don't, don't give it up now, just, just, get, just give it another crack and We'll see what happens and uh, you know, I'm glad I'm dead that I'm over here at the Swans now and really enjoying my time in Sydney. The gloves are on in the orange corner and the Giants are packing plenty of punches. Every game of football you go out there to win and uh, we've got the belief we can do that. Wooden Spoon is in their first two seasons but now in their fifth year the group of talented kids has grown into giant killers. Their 75 point demolition of three time Premier's Hawthorne sending a shiver through the competition. Who's afraid of the big bad giants now? Everybody. And we've beaten the reigning Premiers you know, quite well out here a couple of weeks ago. That certainly gives young players you know, the confidence that they can go out there and expect to actually get, get a result. Star forward Jeremy Cameron turned down big money offers last year from Melbourne clubs and his loyalty could easily pay off sooner than he thought. We're all working to one, one kind of uh, thing which is a premiership and I think it's heading in the right direction so that's why I stayed on board. Do you dare to dream? I do dare to dream, yeah. Well, it is time for Sport Now with Tim Hipsley and Tim Bernard. Tomic's run comes to an end in Brisbane. Yeah, good evening, Amanda. He fought hard but was no match for Canadian Milos Raonic. We'll have all the details after the break. Plus, our Aussie cricketers in a battle for selection. Will the local boy get the nod? Also, Nathan Lyon back in pink and ready to make an impact for the six Sydney Sixers in the Big Bash. And the Melbourne Victory and Central Coast Mariners play out a six-goal thriller.
Good evening. The stage is set for another blockbuster Melbourne derby with the Renegades taking on the stars at Etihad Stadium. And that's where we find 10 commentator Ricky Ponting. Rick, there's plenty riding on this one, isn't there? There always is, mate, in this tournament. Every game's a very important game, I guess. But if you look at this game, it's a must win for the Renegades. The Melbourne Stars are coming off probably their best performance uh, of the tournament against the Hurricanes the other night. So they want to build on that as well. And uh, after Chris Gale's rather eventful week, how do you think he'll respond tonight? Will it affect him at all? I've actually got no idea how he's coping with it. Um, it's obviously been a big week for him in the, in the press. Uh, I think for the game's sake and for the crowd's sake, hopefully he has a great game tonight as well. And moving on to the stars there without James Faulkner, Glenn Maxwell and Scott Boland there on national duties. How do you think they'll cover? I guess it's one of the great tricks, isn't it, to trying to put a squad together is finding the depth when you're going to use, lose your international players. And through the years, the Melbourne Stars have done a great job when their stars have been out. So they'll have three more than capable replacements coming into the side tonight and I'm sure they'll all fire well. Bernard Tomic is now en route to Sydney after bowing out of the Brisbane International. The world number 18 fought hard against Canadian Milos Raonic in the semis, eventually falling 7-6, 7-6. Henry Peters has all the details. It's time for Sport Now with Tim Hipsley and Tim, it's going to be a big night in the Big Bash. Absolutely, Lachlan. There's plenty riding on this one. We'll cross to the SCG for the latest from both the Sixers and Thunder Camps. Plus, our Aussie cricketers arrive in Melbourne, but without another fast bowler. We'll tell you who and why after the break. Also, our tennis bad boys hit the courts ahead of the Australian Open. Is the pressure getting to Nick Kyrgios? And the Aussie closing in on a record-breaking win at the Dakar Rally. Good evening. It's going to be one of the biggest ever Sydney derbies. The Sixers and Thunder are just moments away from doing battle with a Big Bash final spot on the line for both teams. Tens Adam Hawes is boundary side at the SCG. Adam? Yeah, thank you, Tim. The Sydney smash between the Sixers and Thunder is set to break the New South Wales domestic crowd record. Australian selectors have decided to rest Josh Hazelwood for the remainder of the one-day series against India. It follows the Aussies' seven-wicket win at the Gabba last night, where they broke a run-chase record. More from Charles Christian. Play of the daytime, and we know Argentine soccer legend Diego Maradona had some rather fancy footwork on the pitch. Now check out his moves to some Latin hip-hop. <laughs> Look at him go, he loves a dance. At 55 years old, he sure hasn't lost it. A clear winner of our play of the day. Look at him go. Oh, in thongs too. Yeah. Good effort. <laughs> Tim, thank you very much. Stay with us. Amanda Hart has all the weather details next. Tim Bernard Tomic, well, he's blown up again. Yeah, Lachlan, he wasn't happy with the way he was treated after withdrawing from the Sydney International. Hear what he has to say after the break. Also, the Aussies and India upstaged in their one day at the MCG by an unlikely spectator in the stands. The Melbourne Stars and Perth Scorchers will meet once again in a Big Bash semi-final at the MCG on Friday night after a stunning upset that saw the Stars get home by 52 runs. It seemed unlikely after they were 4 for 55 at one stage that Captain David Hussey dug them out of trouble to post 146. In reply, the Scorchers lost the dangerous Michael Klinger for a duck, which ultimately proved the turning point. Frankie Warren makes a massive breakthrough. They're up now, the Stars. One day out from the Blue Water Classic, there were those frantically fixing, while others were spreading the Christmas cheer. <laughs> Still with plenty to do as crews were putting the finishing touches on their preparations. I just got a few sails to uh, put up today and furl up and check over. A bit of a dive of the boat, make sure it's all clean and ready to go and check the rig one last time and yeah, it's just Christmas tradition really now. The fleet of 108 yachts itching to get going. This race is shaping up to be one of the best races we've had in a long, long time. Wild Oats 11 set the race record three years ago in a time of one day, 18 hours and 23 minutes. But conditions this year aren't suited for that record to be broken. It's very much going to be a, almost a textbook Sydney Hobart, you know, a beautiful Norris to start in and uh, Bit of a southerly fun on the first evening and um, just got to tough it out to the next morning and then it's going to be a, a tricky sort of last half of the race. In the white water wash of the Penrith Rapids, <laughs> Jessica Fox is plotting her course for Olympic gold. I guess what's driving me now is um, just the thought of Rio. 
Fox was just 18 when she won silver in London. Since then, she's won six World Championship gold in the C1 and K1 categories. And now at 21, she considers herself a veteran. I think that I've really grown in terms of dealing with pressure, dealing with you know being more adaptable on the water and just racing and enjoying racing a lot more. Pushing Fox even further is her sister, 18-year-old Naomi. To be honest, I don't think my training environment could be any better. I mean, she's such an incredible athlete. Qualifying for Rio begins in February, but there's only one spot available on the Australian slalom team, which means one Fox will miss the cut. Uh, it's horrible. <laughs> it's really horrible, but I think we're just so used to it now. It's a cutthroat race, really. It's probably the toughest race, the Olympic trials. The two girls are somewhat genetically blessed. Their mother Miriam won kayaking bronze at the 96 Olympics for France. Their father Richard, a five-time world champion for Great Britain. And their mother is also their coach. Nice flowy offset. There's never really a clear transition from when we finish training to when we go home. I think canoeing kind of comes with us home sometimes. I'm probably harder on them than I am on the other girls. But she'll need her motherly touch next year when that one place on the Australian team is decided. Tim Hipsleet and Eyewitness News. It was last year right here at the Australian Open that launched Jordan Spieth's remarkable 2015, winning two majors and earning the world number one ranking. And then gain that momentum and, and really have that really mental edge come uh, the weekend that I really could close the deal. Yeah.